Hello and welcome back. Today I will be doing another ocean wave painting. Now if you've been following along here, you know that I recently just did an ocean wave painting that looks similar to this one. That painting was my practice piece for this. This piece is so large that I wanted to practice and have a really good idea of what I wanted to do before I started. The first thing I did was I stretched my watercolor paper. That's when you soak your paper and then tape it down and allow it to dry. This ensures you don't get any warping or bubbling later on while you're painting. And with a piece this large and the fact that I was going to be working almost vertically, it was important that I didn't get that warping or bubbling. Once the paper dried, I set up my projector and projected the image that I drew on my iPad onto my watercolor paper. This ensures that my proportions and scale are accurate in the way I want them to be, and it also ensures that I don't damage the watercolor paper with lots of erasing and drawing. Once traced, I take my Winsor & Newton masking fluid and apply that with the handle of a plastic paintbrush wherever I want the white of the paper to remain. I'm applying this with a paintbrush handle to create an uneven and spotty coverage and to create a lot of texture and give an impressionistic feel to the painting. Um, you'll see it later on. It creates a lot of emo um, motion and uh, depth with this kind of coverage. The reason why I'm using a plastic handled paintbrush, specifically over a wood handled one, is that I don't have to worry about the paint on the wood handle coming off in the masking fluid or transferring color onto the paper. The masking fluid also peels off the plastic handle a lot more easily than it does a wood one, so I don't have to worry about my nice wood handles of my paintbrushes getting damaged by the masking fluid. Whereas my plastic handled paintbrushes receive no damage because it just comes off. Once the masking fluid was fully dry, I wet the paper really well using a two inch paintbrush that was clean and a spray bottle. Um, I wanted to get the paper really wet so I could do wet into wet washes to create soft blends for the base layers of this painting. Um, the spray bottle just helped me ensure that the paper was staying wet as it was so large and it was such a heavy weight of paper that it absorbs a lot of water. So I'm just going in and creating the soft blends of Color. Right now I'm using like a turquoise blue color to create the highlighted areas. Now going in with this paper still wet, I'm starting to add some of the shadowed areas of the painting. Um, since I want soft edges, I am adding those in with the paper wet and then blending them out. Then once I'm happy with that, I let it dry and now I'm coming in and doing another layer. Um, this time I'm adding a phthalo green color to kind of add a green hue to the painting. This painting was a lot of like work really fast and then let it dry and then work really fast and let it dry. That's because I needed to work while the paper was wet and then once I was happy with the layer I needed to let it dry all the way so I could glaze over the top without disturbing the layers that I already did. I also had to be really strategic in the order of where and when I painted certain areas of the painting. With it being so vertical, I ran the risk of a lot of drips happening. And thankfully with this being a water piece that really played into my advantage, but I still had to be careful about when I painted certain areas so that I didn't risk them disturbing other areas of the painting. You can see me here being really diligent with that spray bottle. I'm just kind of following my paintbrush along and just spraying the paper down wherever I'm working. That's so I can control the water in the on the paper and so I can make sure any areas that are drying too quickly I can re-wet so that it keeps moving. I'm also using a phthalo based blue here and if you know anything about paints and pigments Thalo colors are incredibly staining, so once you put that pigment on your paper, there's always going to be a little bit of that color there. It doesn't matter how much you scrub it, it's not coming off or budging, which I used to my benefit here, but I wanted to make sure I wasn't staining areas too dark, and so I was spraying the paper down, making sure that paint was spreading everywhere I wanted it to go. 
The nice thing with the spray bottle is you can also point the water in the direction you want it to go. And so if I wanted the paint to move a little bit more left and being vertical, I couldn't tip my board, I would spray the water that way. And I would use that to my advantage to create motion and give direction to my painting. So I'm being very directional with my brush strokes um, in the sky and in the water. I want this painting to pull your eye around it. And so I want the brush strokes at the bottom kind of leading your eye up to the crest of the wave and then the brush strokes in the sky kind of pulling your eye back down the painting and then kind of just circling around to make your eye bounce around the picture. And I also kept it directional to help give a sense of motion and direction because I wanted it to feel like the wave was about to burst out of the painting when it was finished. And so creating that motion and direction helps give that feeling that it's about to move on out of the picture at any moment. Now I'm coming in and strengthening the shadows and building up the color in the painting. I'm starting to build that contrast, which is what's going to help it become more dimensional and have shape, but I'm doing it in thin layers. That way I can control uh, the details and how much shadows are in specific areas. And so I'm just building it up slowly and then waiting for it to dry and then doing another layer over the top. The hardest thing with this painting was waiting for the layers to dry. This painting measures about 35 by 35 inches and is a heavier weight paper than I typically work on. I usually work on 140 40 pound watercolor paper and this is the arches this is from the arches roll of paper and I believe it's hundred and fifty three pounds um, but it's a heavier weight paper so it holds a lot more water and with it being so large in size it just takes ages for it to dry um, typically I usually use a, a heat tool um, which is a crafting tool used for embossing and things um, to help dry and speed up the drying process, um, but it just wasn't big enough for this painting. And a blow, a blow dryer would push the paint and move the pigments too much, so that didn't work either. So I just had to be patient and just let things dry on their own. And so what I usually did was I'd do a layer and then I would go do my workout for the day or I would go um, prep stuff for dinner or play with my kids or whatever it was I would work on this for 20 minutes and then I'd go do something else for about 20 to 30 minutes while it dried and then come back and work on it for another 20 to 30 minutes and just did this back and forth um, to kind of keep working on it but also not sit around all day playing on my phone so that's how I kind of stayed productive but it was really, really hard to wait for the layers to dry. But if I didn't, when I would go over and glaze over the top, it would mess up the layers that I already did. So I just had to work really slowly and be as patient as possible. So you might have noticed that I look like I've just rolled out of bed so far for most of this painting and that's because I had. Um, with the holiday rush and everything going on, I had to wake up even earlier than my normal 4 o'clock. I had to get up at 3 to make sure I could get this painting done and shipped on time. Um, with the holidays and everything going on, um, it's been a little crazy down here. Um, I told my husband that I was turning into a studio troll where I just basically lived in my studio and I only came up stairs for water and sleep. And it was just it was just a really busy, crazy time. Um, I think this painting was my eighth painting um, in the last like seven weeks um, that I had to get done and it all had to be shipped and arrive um, by Christmas. This one I had a little bit more flexibility because this one was not a Christmas present. But I did have to get it shipped on time so the interior designer could get it framed and installed into the house 
um, by it or by her deadline. And so there was just a lot of really, really early mornings for me and a lot of days just spent painting. And so, and with the holidays and Christmas concerts and different activities for the kids and different things, I really had to front load um, my work schedule. So I had to do it all in the morning and then in the afternoon, I'd get ready for the day and go to Christmas concerts and take my kids to their activities or whatever it was. Um, and so it was just a little chaotic and crazy. And I almost didn't post this video because I was really embarrassed that I was pretty much in pajamas for all of it. But I wanted to give a more accurate representation of what it's like being an artist, especially when you're working as a commissioned artist in the rush holiday season. It's not very glamorous and you're just in your studio and you don't leave your house and you're just painting all of the time. And that's where we were. Um, my husband's schedule is a little crazy because he's a medical resident, but he helped as much as he could. Um, he made a lot of the dinners and took care of the kids um, and got them to bed and stuff when he was home, but it was just crazy. And, but with all of that, I'm so proud of this painting and how it's turned out. And, you know, I, as stressful as it was in the moment, I wouldn't go back because this holiday season, I've created some of my favorite pieces of art and they've really pushed me in new levels. And so, you know, there's give and take and, positives and negatives to anything you you do and and this was one of those experiences for me once I felt like I had built up enough shadows and contrast in the painting and I was done with the really wet layers of paint um, I decided to remove the masking fluid that way I could better judge the contrast and the areas that needed to be worked because the masking fluid kind of blocks it off and the paint sits on it so I don't fully know how much white is there and all of those types of things so I needed to remove the masking fluid at this point so I could gauge where I needed to take the painting next it took quite a while to remove all the masking fluid because there was a lot on this picture um, not just what you saw in the beginning where I did it before I started painting but in between layers of paint I would add more masking fluid to block off those areas so I had a gradient of colors and different shades of pale blue blocked off so I could work in those areas later on with wet washes without worrying of covering it all. So a lot of work was spent uh, removing masking fluid and getting it to a place where I could start on the next layer because you don't want to leave masking fluid on your painting. You, you want to make sure you remove it all because it will turn yellow um, after a while because it is not archival or light fast. And so I'm just rubbing my hand over wherever I've been rubbing with the rubber pickup to make sure all the masking fluid is removed. And here I am back in my painting clothes after the Christmas concert for my kids and just working on the painting. I was really excited with where it was looking after I removed all the masking fluid because then I got all that bright white contrast that really made everything pop. So now I'm just going in and toning down really bright areas that are standing out too much and kind of focusing where I want the whites to be and adding that dimension and color to it. So at this point in the painting, I'm really focusing my energy on getting the darks dark enough to create the mood and everything I was going for, for this picture. I needed to have a really strong contrast between the turquoise part of the wave and the whites and so to make that area pop I had to get those darks dark enough and it was really interesting because I it was interesting seeing what colors I gravitated to to make the different colors I needed for this picture um, I used a lot of burnt umber mixed with um, ultramarine blue and ultramarine purple to get those really dark colors and they turned out really really pretty uh, it was really nice not using like a straight black but they look almost black um, in contrast with the other colors I also used a lot of I used all of the blues on my palette um, I used my M. Graham watercolor palette um, for this piece and so I used 
ultramarine blue, cerulean blue, cobalt blue, um, phthalo blue. I use Prussian blue and uh, the cobalt turquoise, I believe it is. And I also used a lot of phthalo greens and I used a lot of purples to create this piece. And it was a really fun piece to work on. I really love when I get to use like a specific color scheme in a painting. So this one was mostly in the cool side of the color spectrum and it was really fun. So once all the paint dried and I got it about 90% there in darkness and value, I started coming in with my white um, Dr. P.H. Martin's Bombay ink to bring in some details and add some more white and texture to the crest of the painting and to the highlights on the water. That way I could kind of reinforce those highlights, create some white splatters to make it look like there's water spraying everywhere and really kind of get that definition and contrast and details that I'm looking for. Um, I really like using Dr. Page Martin's Bombay ink. Um, it's light fast and it is waterproof. And so I can do washes of color when I'm tweaking other areas and not have to worry about it lifting up like I would with gouache. And so with me not liking to commit to something too early, um, I really like being able to adjust as I go along. Um, if I I can also tweak the color of the ink by adding a little bit of blue to it if I want it to be a light blue instead of a, a pure white color. Now I'm just have my reference photos that I'm going off of. This isn't one particular photo. Um, I'm kind of bouncing between a bunch of different photos and how I want this water to look. Um, and I also took a lot of artistic liberties as well. I liked the shape of one picture and I liked the color of another picture and I liked the sky from another one. And so there was a lot of photoshopping and kind of tweaking to kind of get this picture um, how I wanted it to look. And so I'm just looking at my pictures, kind of seeing where I want the lights to hit, how I want the sky to contrast with the wave. And one tricky area is the area where the foam is because the water's coming down and you want that to contrast but then there's also the foam mist business going on in the back and so trying to get that to recede visually but still breed as a pale light color um, took a quite a bit of work and just adjusting back and forth. I would paint for a little bit and then I would take a step back on this painting and then look at it and then come back and paint some more and there was just a lot of back and forth and like talked about earlier, there was a lot of glazing. If there was one word to describe this painting, it was just glazing. So many layers and waiting for them to dry and then doing another one and adjusting. But I'm so happy I took the time to glaze so many layers because it really created this luminous look to the painting and gave me the contrast I'm, I was really looking forward to. It's really funny watching this video on this painting because the paint brushes I look like I'm using are just so tiny in comparison. The previous brush I was using before this was a 30 round brush, which is a really large round paintbrush, um, especially in watercolor. And it just looked tiny. And my two inch flat paintbrush looked tiny as well with working on this painting. And so it's just really funny because I, I don't get to use those brushes very often in my normal watercolors because they're too big. And in this painting, they were almost too small. Um, and here I am adding more ink layers. Um, I used a brush for part of it, and then I'm using my finger to help create the bubbly, foamy texture that isn't too precise. Um, I find that my fingers are really helpful when doing that. So just kind of going in and adding more and more layers. So now I'm coming in with some more inks, but this time I'm using uh, a mixture of blues and green um, iridescent inks. Um, these are the Dr. P.H. Martin's iridescent inks. 
And these just kind of add a shimmer and a shine to the water to help create that luminous, glowy feel. Um, if you watch my previous video, you saw me use them on there as well. Um, but it just helped create a fun, kind of glistening look to the painting that I really, really enjoyed. And those inks are also waterproof and so they don't budge and you can just kind of create fun looks with them. I also used a mixture of silver and white iridescent inks up in the foamy areas to kind of create some contrast and shimmer in that area as well. So now I'm taking the white ink and I'm just splattering it all over the picture. I'm trying to keep the splatters mostly in the direction that it would go with the wave. But I, I splattered the paint because it really helped create a lot of movement and gave that effect of mist and water droplets going everywhere like it would with the wave coming down. Um, I, it, it's just something you can't create just by dabbing the paints as much. You really just need to let the paint do its thing and the ink just go naturally and it creates a more organic look. And once I started doing that, it really made this painting come alive. Um, I used different sizes of paintbrushes. I used different um, consistencies of ink for it. I used toothbrushes that I used to splatter to create different types of mist and bubble and droplet effects. And I really, really like how it turned out because I feel like it really made this painting pop. Once the paint was splattered, there. The painting was almost done. There was just a few small tweaks I needed to do to adjust the painting to make it just right. Um, I needed to darken the left hand bottom corner um, because that I found that was distracting because it was too light and then just make the final finishing touches. And this is the finished piece and I'm so thrilled with how it turned out. And I hope you enjoyed watching this video and gained some helpful tips for you as you watercolor paint. And if you like this video, please hit the like button. And if you want to see more of what I create, please hit the subscribe button. Have a great day. Bye.